God is the God of another opportunity. God is a God who likes new things. He says, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead. God's mentality is the latter glory will be greater than the former. There's a new day coming. I don't care if you are 99, God has something new for you. church would you stand to your feet we've come to offer him praise he is the king of kings he is the lord of lords let's offer him the praise he is due
Amen. Would you be seated? And let's worship with those who are declaring that Jesus is their Savior. Good morning, everyone. It is a great joy to be here in the baptistry today. I'm here with two 10-year-old girls who've come to be baptized today. They've already repented of their sins, believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead to save them, and have received Jesus into their life as their Lord and Savior. And they've come today to be baptized, to follow the Lord in believers' baptism. And we begin today with Emma Jones. And Emma, it's my great joy to baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried with Jesus in baptism into death, and we are raised to walk in newness of life. God bless you, Emma. You love the Lord and serve Him faithfully. And this is Julia Stone King. She has family watching in New Jersey today. And she is the granddaughter of Virgin and Seal Stone King. And she's here for the summer for a few weeks. And she told me that she came to know the Lord when she was three years old and is now today following him in believer's baptism. And Julia, it's my great joy to baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried with Jesus in baptism into death, and we are raised to walk in newness of life. God bless you, Julia. You love the Lord and serve Him joyfully. And all God's people rejoiced and said, Amen. Amen. That's worth celebrating. Amen. Well, amen. Why don't you stand, look around, and welcome each other to church this morning. Make a new friend in Christ. Let's sing about that matchless name.
let's all sing. You're my rock, my redeemer. There is power in your name. Sing to him, church. I want us, before we have uh, continue with our service, I want us to pray for God to intervene in Charlottesville. And many of you have been seeing that. How many of you know what I'm talking about, the vision? Okay. If it's physically possible for you to do so, would you please go to your knees? If you can't do it, that's fine. But if you can physically do that, let's get down on our knees and ask God to forgive our country for racism and also to stop the division you pray and then I'll pray momentarily Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer, and we thank you that you're a very present help in time of need. Lord, our nation today needs to know Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask you to forgive those white supremacists who have Lord, abused freedom of speech and have spread their racial slurs across our nation. And we rebuke every curse that they would put upon our nation. And we pray that you would turn it into a blessing. We thank you, Lord, for every person. As the little song we sang when we were kids, red yellow black white we are all precious in your sight we ask you to lord stop these people that are filled with hate and we pray in the name of jesus that you would rebuke the demonic spirits behind them and bind them in jesus name and father for anybody in this nation regardless of what color their skin is that hates other people because of their ethnicity or their color of skin we pray for the Holy Ghost to give them light 
and to convict them of sin and righteousness and judgment that they might repent and return to you that their sins may be washed away the times of refreshing may come upon our land we stand against the demonic spirits of racial division and we say to you the Lord Jesus Christ rebuke you in the name of Jesus through his shed blood by the power of the Word of God and the Spirit of God we command you away from this nation from Maine to Florida to Texas to California to Washington to Minnesota back to Maine all across continental United States Alaska and Hawaii Lord we pray your peace we pray your spirit would blanket this area that the Spirit of God would come upon your people and Lord God that we would be the leaders in letting people know that you have created us to be one and dear God there is only one race the human race you have made us all in the image of God Jesus you died for all of us all of us are precious in your sight help us to love each person regardless and Lord intervene we ask miraculously do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think we pray this for your glory in Jesus name and if you agree say amen amen Hi, I'm Steve Gaines this is my wife Donna Gaines this is our son Grant Gaines and we want to invite you to go with us to the Holy Land we want you to experience Israel with us. You know, I've spent a lot of time reading books and studying biblical history and biblical backgrounds, but nothing has helped the Bible come to life for me more than actually being there and seeing the places that you read about, both in the Old and New Testaments. I found that to be true myself. You will never read the Bible the same way again because you're able to visualize the places that you've actually walked in and experienced uh, along with your group. One of the most meaningful to me is when we visit the Praetorium and it's where they've actually excavated down to the Roman pavement where Jesus would have been scourged and would have started the walk to Calvary. It is always one of the most moving places that we visit. This will be my 12th time to go and I am just as excited today as I was the first time I went. I'll never forget the first time I saw the Sea of Galilee. I literally cried. I could not believe I was standing where Jesus and his disciples had been. We also go down to the Jordan River and we have a baptismal service, a great time there. If you want to be baptized, we'll be glad to baptize you in the River Jordan. And then we go to the Dead Sea and then we end up at Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified and where he was buried and where he was raised from the dead. Experience the Holy Land on a 10-day journey through Israel with Steve and Donna Gaines and Grant Gaines, January 17 through 26, 2018. To learn how you can be a part of this journey, attend our informational meeting tonight in the chapel after our Sunday evening service. It is a trip of a lifetime and we want you to join us and go be with us in Israel, the Holy Land. How many of you have ever been to Israel? Raise your hand. Anybody out there? Several of you have. If you want to know more about it tonight, we'll be in the chapel right there after the service. We'd love to have you come, and uh, we'd love to be able to share with you the information. We'd love to have you join us in January. Boy, I was fat in that picture, wasn't I? Man, I'll tell you what. I had a gobbler going on, man. What's up with that? Anyway, we, uh, we hope that you'll be there tonight. I, you were thinking it, so I thought I'd just say it, all right? Yeah. Yeah. You see, you, I, can, I can hear what you're thinking up here, man, all right? Hey, my wife is uh, a godly lady, you know that, and she has written, I think it's her fourth book, is that correct? And uh, it's from Proverbs, it's about the two women of Proverbs, wisdom and folly, choose wisely, live fully, and she is having a book signing this afternoon at four o'clock in the West Lobby, I know that she's my wife, but I want you to thank God for Miss Donna. Can we do that today? What a sweet, she doesn't like, <laughs> amen. And uh, y'all come by and meet her, whether you get a book or not, she would be just glad to meet you uh, this afternoon. If you're a guest, we're so honored to have you today, and we would like to give you a gift. It's our gift bag, 
And uh, you, hopefully you picked up a bulletin on the way in. If you did not, then you can get one on the way out there at every doorway. And when you get that, to the right, there is a piece of paper there that's perforated. It says, let's get acquainted. Just tear it off, fill it out. And then when you leave, you'll find welcome tables all across around the sanctuary. Just hand that to one of those folks out there, and they will give you your Bellevue gift bag. It has a lot of neat things in it I think you'll really want to have, and we want you to have it. So do that after the service. And if you have a minute, my wife, Donna, and I would love to meet you in Guest Central outside these doors. Uh, it's, it's Actually, are we going to be in Guest Central today? Like I said, we're going to be in the chapel right back here. I'm glad people know where I'm supposed to be. Right back behind you here, we would love to meet you. And if you come back there, we'll give you a Bible promise book as well. Alex Leon, who is the minister of our married 30s, and he is doing a bang-up job. We all had a little, once, once a year, we take the staff out and do something fun, and we raced go-karts. I want you to know he beat everybody, all right? I mean, this guy can drive like nobody's business. If you're in a hurry, call him up, all right? He can get you where. Why is everybody, what's all this blue? Tell me what's going on today. Well, Brother Steve, today is Connect Day, and everyone here that is not a part of a, of a life group is going to have an opportunity to visit one of the lobbies, learn more about life groups at 8, 9, 20, and 11 o'clock, and get connected, maybe even today. All right. Well, thank you for what you do. This is a great guy. He and his wife and their children love the Lord. Let's thank the Lord for him. Praise the Lord for him. And would you lead us in our offertory prayer? Sure. Okay. Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather in your house today, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for all the gifts that you give us, Father. It's our privilege to give it right back, Father. So as we give right now, Lord, we do it with a heart of thanksgiving and gratefulness for what you've done and what you will continue to do. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, if you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies, if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, yeah, well, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. And if you feel lost, well, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, save. Prison shaking Savior, if you got chains, well, he's a chain breaker. Yes. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we do just stay right. But there's a better line, oh, there's a better line. And if you got pain, he's a great Yes, he is. If you got lost, he's a great And if you need freedom, well, save him. Well, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, well, he's a chain. can feel it. Somebody testify, yes. If you believe it. Oh, if you receive it. If you can feel it. Somebody testify, testify.
if you feel lost, he's a way maker. Yes, he is. If you need freedom or saving, well, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got jail, well, he's a jailbreaker. Yes, he is. Every person in this room is a leader. You say, what in the world are you talking about? I'm not a deacon. I'm not a teacher. I'm not on staff. I'm not even an usher. What do you mean I'm a leader? Every person in this room is a leader. What is a leader? A leader is someone who influences someone else. Leadership is influence. Say that with me. Leadership is influence. And whether you know it or not, you influence someone. You know what I found out? Just because you have a title doesn't mean that you influence as many people as you think you do. And just because you don't have a title you might influence more people than the person that has the title does. Leadership is not about who has the title and who doesn't have the title. Leadership is about influencing other people. And look at me, every one of you has a sphere of influence. You are influencing someone. And you and I as Christians need to be better leaders, don't you think? Because we need to influence people for Jesus Christ. You might just influence two or three people, but you know what? To them, you're a leader. And how do you know that the people that you lead, they might become one of the greatest leaders ever. They might have more influence than you can even fathom. Some of those children you're influencing, sweet mother, that you're staying at home or maybe you're working and having to work two jobs to help your kids, you are very valuable to the people you lead. And so today I want to talk to you about Christian leadership. 26 years ago, Don and I moved to Alabama. We'd been there just a few months, and this lady comes up to Don and she says, I, and she was from the north, she said, I can't believe how many people go to college down here. Don said, what are you talking about? She said, well, everybody has a bumper sticker on their car that says either Alabama or Auburn. <laughs> Donna said, that does not mean that they went to college. <laughs> How many of you know that in Alabama they like football? Anybody know that? Man, we, did, we, we just couldn't believe how much they, they, they liked football. I mean, if Alabama lost, we were down 400 on Sunday. If Auburn lost, we were down two or 300 on Sunday. And if they both lost, might as well just stay home. I'm just telling you, nobody wants to come to church. But uh, there was this picture we kept seeing in grocery stores, in businesses, in homes. 
It was this picture of this man with this weird hat. Who was it? Mary. I, I see some of y'all don't like to say his name <laughs> because he has beaten you relentlessly <laughs> over the years. Bear Bryant, born 1913, died 1983, just shy of being 70 years old. For 25 years, he coached the University of Alabama football team, won six national championships, 13 conference championships. That's why some people don't like him. He retired in 1982 and at that time was the most winning college football coach in history with 323 wins. He was famous for this black and white houndstooth hat. He spoke with this deep southern drawl. When I was a kid, I used to like seeing the beginning of the games, before the games, in the warm-ups. He would come out and he would lean on the end zone pole. He'd just lean on it and watch his players. I thought that was the coolest thing. Don't know why, I just liked it. And under him, Alabama became a national football powerhouse. And regardless of what you think about college football, he was a great leader. Only two others. Every other Alabama coach has been measured by Bear Bryant. How would you like to follow Bear Bryant? Only two others have had success at doing that. One was Gene Stallings and one is Nick Saban. Some say that Saban might replace him one day in being the most beloved coach in Alabama. Time will tell. But one thing is certain, in college football, for you to have a good team, you've got to have a good coach. You've got to have a good leader. You cannot win if you don't have a good leader. John Maxwell says, everything rises or falls on leadership. I believe that's a true statement. As the leaders go, so go the people that follow them. Now, does this concept apply to Christianity? Absolutely. Absolutely. God used great leaders throughout the Bible. He used even obscure leaders throughout the Bible. He used all kinds of people to influence others for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I want to talk to you about today. God wants to use you to influence people. God wants to use you to lead people. When you influence them, you lead them. When you lead them, you influence them. I'm telling you it's a synonym. It's the same thing. And God wants to use you. You say, how can God use me? God changed the world in 30 years. The 30 years right after Jesus was on this earth, they went from a relatively small town with the gospel called Jerusalem. They went throughout the Roman Empire. They went, yea, to the greatest city in the world at that time, Rome itself. And within just a few centuries, Rome came under the lordship of Jesus Christ. How did they do that? Well, they had a great power, the power of the Holy Spirit. They had a great message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they had great leaders. And that's what I want to talk to you about. How can you be a leader that God can use to influence our nation. How many of you believe that our nation needs to be influenced in the right way? All right, look at me. Quit talking about everybody else and start taking care of your sphere of influence. That's the best thing you can do. Pray for the others, but you need to do something about your sphere of influence. You need to lead the way you're supposed to lead, and I want to give you some marks of a great leader coming from the Apostle Paul. Let's talk today about successful Christian leaders. What are the marks of a successful Christian leader? Number one, successful Christian leaders raise up new leaders. Immediately, they just start thinking about the next generation, those who will follow them. Look at verse 1. Paul came also to Derby, 
Now we're on the second missionary journey here. And to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. That's in the imperfect tense. It means that his daddy was probably dead. His dad was a Gentile. Timothy was Paul's favorite son in the ministry. In 1 Timothy 1.18, Paul called Timothy his son. In 2 Timothy 1.2, he called him his beloved son. And when Paul and Barnabas had been traveling through Lystra two or three years earlier, they found this young boy. They led him to Jesus Christ. They led his mother, Eunice, to Christ. They led his grandmother, Lois, to Christ. And uh, Timothy became well-known as a godly young man, and his reputation had spread for the last two or three years all over his hometown and that entire area where he lived. The Bible says, though, he had a problem. He was a Gentile in some of the people's eyes because he had never been circumcised. The Bible says, though, that even though that was the case, he was really walking with the Lord. Verse 2 says, he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. But even though his mother was Jewish, Timothy had never been circumcised. And so here's what happened. The, the Gentiles considered him a Jew because of his mother, but the Jews considered him a Gentile because he'd never been circumcised. He was a man that really didn't fit in. And so Paul figured out that he needed to help this young man by having him circumcised. Look at verse 3. Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now he said, now wait a minute. I thought Paul was the one that was all upset at the Jerusalem council telling them, that you don't have to be circumcised in order to be saved. That's exactly right. This has nothing to do with salvation. He was not saying that Timothy wasn't saved. He was saying, you know what? Like he talked about in 1 Corinthians 9, we need to become all things to all men that we may by all means save some. He said, to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, I came as under the law that I might win those under the law. Paul said, look, let's just defer here Let's use some wisdom here. This is not about salvation. The Jerusalem Council was correct. If you're a Gentile, you don't have to become a Jew to become a Christian. You don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to keep the Old Testament law. But just in deference to everybody else out there, especially the Jews, let's just have him circumcised. That's what's going on. And we need more of that deferring spirit in the church. We need people not demanding their rights, but we need people who will be loving and compassionate toward other people and live in deference and respect with other people. And Paul was a leader because he raised up new leaders like Timothy. In his book, Good Leaders Ask Great Questions, leadership expert John Maxwell, he quotes a political commentator. He says, Walter Lippmann said, the final test of a leader is that he leaves behind in others the conviction and the will to carry on. And then Maxwell goes on to say himself, ultimately, if your people can't do a job without you, you have not been a successful person in raising up other leaders. There are people in your world who would be thrilled to learn from you. The greatest legacy any leader can leave is having developed other leaders. If you want to leave a legacy, invest in people. People are what matter in this world, not money, fame, buildings, organizations, or institutions, only people. Leaders put their people into a position to do great things without them, and the legacy of successful leaders lives on through the people they touch and raise up along the way. I want to ask you, who are you raising up to be a Christian leader once you're gone? Who are you leaving behind? What oak trees, spiritually speaking, are you planting out there? Who are you trying to raise up? You know, Paul wrote these words to Timothy, and it talks about a four-generational mindset that we ought to constantly think about the people we're leaving behind. Paul said to Timothy, write this reference down if you will, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, 
the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Four levels. First of all, Paul. Paul was a leader. And then he spoke into the lives of Timothy and many witnesses. And then he expected Timothy and those many witnesses to speak into the lives of faithful men. And then he expected those faithful men to speak to others as well. Paul had not only just the vision for what was going on right then, but what would go on behind him. And that's the way it is throughout the Bible. Moses mentored and raised up Joshua who went into the promised land. When God kept Moses back, Joshua, who he mentored, went into the promised land, took the promised land in just a matter of a few short years. Elijah raised up Elisha. And then Samuel raised up a young guy named David. Everybody else just saw a shepherd. But God told Samuel that he would be a great king. Barnabas and Peter, we talked about this last week, mentored and raised up John Mark who wrote the first the, uh, gospel. He wrote, it's second in your Bible, but it's the first one to be written. And he was a great man of God. Paul mentored many people, but especially Tim Timothy. Now some of you are saying, well, how can I raise up anybody? I don't have time to talk about all of it. Let me just give you one great piece of advice. You want to raise people up? Here it is. Never do ministry alone. Say that with me. Never do ministry alone. Don't. You go out you go on a soul winning visit, take somebody with you. You study for a lesson once in a while, you're preparing for a lesson, once in a while get somebody to study it with you and show them how you do it, show them how you teach. When you go to a hospital visit, take somebody with you. When you pray, the best way to learn how to pray is to pray with somebody that knows how to pray. If you know how to pray, every once in a while take somebody in and show them how to pray, how to read the Bible, how to live the Christian life. Listen, Christianity is caught more than it is taught. You need to have people around you. I know that sometimes you just like that downtime and sometimes you need it, but sometimes you need to give that up so you can mentor and disciple somebody else. What do Christian leaders do? I'll tell you what they do. They raise up new leaders even be way before they th they're thinking about checking out, okay? Number two, successful Christian leaders encourage believers. You need to be an encourager, not a discourager. You don't need to constantly tell everybody the bad stuff and all that can go wrong. Now look, I'm all for troubleshooting. I'm all for being realistic. But some people just have a cloud over their head like that guy in Charlie Brown, you know, area. It just goes around, they just got a cloud over them all the time. Listen, you need to encourage people. What is that? Putting courage back into other people. Get your mind off of yourself. That's what these guys did. Look at verse 4. Now, while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. What's that all about? If you know chapter 15, we've just gone through that. The Bible says that the Jerusalem council said, hey, we want you to know you do not have to, if you're a Gentile, you do not have to become a Jew. You don't have to be, be circumcised and keep the law in order to become a Christian. And so this was encouraging these people. And notice what happened when they got encouraged, verse 5. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. The more the Christians were encouraged, the more they told other people about Jesus Christ. That's just the way it is. When you're down and discouraged, you're not going to be a very effective soul winner. You're not going to be a, a very effective uh, witness for Jesus. But when you are encouraged and when God is strengthening you, you want to tell other people about Jesus Christ. So the second thing these Christian leaders knew to do was they encouraged believers. Aren't you grateful to God that God is the great encourager? Aren't you grateful that God will encourage you through His Word? He'll encourage you through a song. He'll encourage you through a worship service. He'll encourage you in a life group. He'll encourage you in a discipleship group. He'll encourage you in a lot of different ways. But aren't you grateful that God is a great encourager? Did you know that everybody in the Bible at some time needed to be encouraged? David one day, he was a great man of God. He wrote all kinds of psalms. He was a great 
sweet man of God, great warrior too, but he needed encouragement sometimes. And there was a day when he had gone out with his warriors, and while he was gone, the Amalekites attacked their camp. They kidnapped their wives, and they kidnapped their children, and they, kid and they stole all of their valuables. They came back to camp, and here it is, and all of the people under David were ready to kill him. Isn't that what you do? When things go wrong, you kill the leader, right? That's kind of the way it goes. And so they were ready just to take him out. What did David do? Did he run and hide? No. He ran to the Lord. Listen to this. 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. David was now in great danger because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters. They began talking about stoning him. But David found strength in the Lord his God. I believe he prayed. Maybe he prayed Psalm 23. Lord, you're my shepherd, I shall not want. You make me to lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside the still waters. You restore my soul. Who was it that restored his soul? Who was it that put courage and strength back into David? Ultimately, it was the Lord his God. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there is pleasure forevermore. Who wrote that? Psalm 16, David wrote it. David was encouraged by the Lord. Aren't you grateful to God that God still encourages people? You know, as you look on these three missionary journeys that Paul would take, yes, they were winning people to Jesus left and right, but I'll tell you something else. They were encouraging people. When they started the first missionary journey, when, or when they were on the first missionary journey, the Bible says in Acts 14, 21, after they had preached the gospel to that city, then they made many disciples. They returned to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. Here it is, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them, putting courage back in them to continue in the faith. And they were saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. The second missionary journey begins at the end of Acts 15. And here's what the Bible says Paul did on the second missionary journey, Acts 15, 41. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia. What was he doing? Strengthening, that is encouraging the churches. And when we get to the third missionary journey that's over in Acts 18, guess what he's doing? He's strengthening people. The Bible says in Acts 18, 23, having spent some time there, he left. He passed successfully through the Galatian region and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Everywhere he went, he put courage back into people. He strengthened people with the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Junior Hill is a dear friend of mine, and I heard him say years ago, there are three ways you can encourage people. If you are smart, and I know you're all brilliant, you will write this down. You can do it with your pen. You say, what are you talking about? You can take your pen and write somebody a note. Does anybody remember writing? Not just typing. Write somebody a note. I think it's more special, if you will, when you actually handwrite a note. That's just me. But you can also text. You can also uh, send an email. You can send a letter, a card. Do it with your pen. Do it with your purse. I'm talking about money. Give somebody a gift card. Give somebody some money to help them out. You know, find somebody that's lost their job and give them some cash. You might even want to do it anonymously. But just encourage people financially. And then do it with your presence. There's something about just going to somebody and saying, hey, I heard you're having a going through a tough time, just want to tell you I love you, and just talk with them, and just the ministry of presence. I, listen, I, I heard that, I heard him say that about 15 years ago. I have never forgotten that. And there are times I sit around, how can I, how can I encourage somebody? Ah, oh, my pen, my purse. I don't care, I want to carry a wallet, thank you very much. But anyway, I, and my presence, I can help them out. How many of you want to be an encouragement to somebody? Put courage back into people. Look at me. Good thing, because when you sow that seed, you're going to reap that harvest. When you sow encouragement, guess what? God's going to give it back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running 
over. You want to be a successful Christian influencer, a successful Christian leader, encourage believers. Number three, successful Christian leaders follow the Spirit. This is one of the most interesting texts on following the Spirit in the whole Bible. There are some people who say, oh, God doesn't have a special will for your life. Just whatever you do is the pre-programmed will of God. You just do whatever you want to do. Well, that's not what it says here. Get your theology from the Bible on that and everything else. It says they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region. Look at verse 6. Having been forbidden, follow the Spirit is what we're talking about. Having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Ah, the Holy Spirit said don't go down there. Don't go southwest into Phrygia and Galatia. And after they had come to Messia, they were trying to go into Bithynia. That was northeast. And the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, did not permit them. And passing by Messia, they came down to Troas. Paul and his companions passed. They went through the Phrygian and the Galatian region. That was southwest in Asia. The Holy Ghost said, don't go there. Not time for you to go there. You know, God doesn't really have to tell you, by the way, why He doesn't want you to do something. If He says no, just say, sounds good to me. I think I'll just keep going the way I'm going. They tried to go northeast over to Bithynia. Spirit of Jesus forbade them, did not permit them. Holy Spirit was leading them through inner impressions, maybe through prophetic words. At that time, they didn't have the New Testament Scriptures. But He was directing them. He was saying, don't do this. But then he told them where they should go. They wound up at a place called Troas. They kept traveling kind of northeast or northwest. And when they got to Troas, Paul went to sleep one night and God came to him in a dream, in a night vision. And there was a man from Macedonia. That was over, included Greece. It was over in what would become Europe. And he said, come over and help us. And many people have said, how do you know he's from Macedonia? Because he said, come over to Macedonia and help us. Hello? Don't make things hard. They're not hard. And so Paul wakes up, and he knows God has been talking to him. He goes to these people, and he said, hey, I had this vision. God won't let us go down here. He won't let us go up there, but he's telling us to go here. What do you think? And they all talked about it. And notice the Bible says, verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man, Macedonia, was standing and appealing to him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Verse 10, when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought, we sought, notice Luke now is including himself in the missionary journey. Apparently he lived or was around Troas. And so he joins Silas and Paul and Timothy and maybe some others we don't know about, and he's with them now, we concluded that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, why is this such a big deal? Look at me. Look, look. We live in America. Where did we get the gospel from? From Europe. Where did they get the gospel from? From Paul. Paul, when he crossed over from Troas to Neapolis and to Macedonia and Philippi, that's what would become Europe. And for centuries after Paul preached the gospel there, it just exploded, man, when he went there. And that area of Europe became the epicenter of Christianity for centuries, and they sent missionaries to the whole world, to Africa, to China, to every place you can imagine, Asia, and even what would become the United States of America. And I'm not over speaking here. We would not be in this room had Paul not responded to that divine vision at Troas. Do you understand the significance of your choices? Do you understand that it's not just you that is involved. It is your future generations and people way after you can be influenced, can be led by a Christian and making the right response. The Bible says in verse 11, so putting out to the sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace. That's about halfway there in the Aegean Sea. And on the day following to Neapolis, we get our 
the name of our town, Naples, like Naples, Florida from uh, Neapolis. It means new city, Nea, new, polos, city. And they arrived in two days, 150 miles in two days. They had to have some really good winds because on the way back, it took them five days to come back. They came against the, the contrary winds. And they landed in Neapolis and they walked 10 miles north to Philippi, verse 12. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. We were staying in this city for some days. Christian leaders follow the Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible says, God says, you will hear a voice behind you. I believe this is Isaiah 30, verse 21. You will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it whenever you turn to the right or the left. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, John 10. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give eternal life to them. No one shall ever snatch them out of my hand. Does God speak today? Sure He does. He speaks in a lot of ways through the inner promptings of the Holy Spirit. I'll never forget 12 years ago, 12 and 13 years ago, 2004, 2005, when Don and I were praying about coming here. With all due respect, wonderful church, but we had a wonderful church where we were. We'd raised our kids there. Grant was in the third grade when we went. He had graduated. Now he was in college. And they had just loved it. He was Mr. Gardendale High School. Lindsay was Miss Gardendale High School. The girls were cheerleaders and all of that. We enjoyed it. We just bought 150 acres to relocate the church and all of that. And all of a sudden, Bellevue starts knocking on our door. We didn't know what to do. We were just in love with these people. We had on Easter Sunday, our last Easter, that we had 10,200 people at the equivalent of the FedEx Forum in downtown Birmingham, the Birmingham Jefferson Civic Center. We had 100 people get saved on Easter that day. We didn't want to go anywhere. I love Dr. Rogers. He wanted me to come, but I had to have more than that. So we started praying. Now, long story short, God spoke to my heart so clearly through a text in the book of Judges that I was supposed to come here. i never forget. I went back to Don and told her about it. You know what she said? God told me a month ago. (laughs) What can I say? But we knew, and you know, it was tough. The first two years was really tough here. And if we hadn't had that call of God, we would not have stayed. But we knew God wanted us to be here. And I want to say this to you. I'd rather preach at Bellevue Baptist Church than any church I know of. You know why? Because I know I'm called of God to be here. But I want to say this to you. That comes from the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit doesn't just lead preachers. He leads you. He leads you. He leads you. He he wants you. Sometimes He'll say no. Sometimes He'll say go. What do you do when He says says no? Just sit where you are and just be involved where you are and don't look around for a better deal. Stay in your lane and keep swimming. Just stay in there and keep serving the Lord. Don't go for something else. Don't just say, well, I just think, no, no, no. I feel like, don't worry about your feelings. God will speak to you. He'll speak to you through the Bible. He'll speak to you through a preacher. He'll speak to you through your spouse. He'll speak to you through a sermon. He'll speak to you through this strong, compulsive inner impression of the Holy Ghost. He'll speak to you through godly friends. God is not quiet. And when He is quiet, just wait on him. Just wait on him. Bible says in Isaiah 40, 31, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength, mount up with wings like eagles, run and not get tired, walk and not become weary. His Spirit will tell you what not to do. His Spirit will tell you what to do. Listen and follow. Listen to and follow the voice of the Holy Ghost because Christian leaders, that's what they do. They follow the Spirit. And very quickly, successful Christian leaders share Jesus. Look at verses 13 and 14. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down, began speaking to the women who had assembled. Verse 14, a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken of by Paul. Isn't that beautiful? Why were they there? To tell people about Jesus. What was Paul's pattern? He would go to the synagogue first, 
He wanted to take the gospel of the Jew first, then to the Greeks, then to the Gentiles. But there was no synagogue. You had to have 10 men to have a synagogue, 10 Jewish men. They didn't have it, but they had some godly ladies, and they were praying. And Paul just goes there and shares the gospel, and this lady named Lydia just gets saved. She just gets saved. I mean, she, she just fell in love with the Lord right there. How did that happen? They were led by the Spirit, and they shared the Word of God. I'm so grateful for all of our deacons. But Baron Muga, uh, he didn't know I was going to use this illustration. Today, but he's one of the sweetest people we got in the church. And he is one of the most faithful men of God I know. Every month, he takes a group down to Beale Street. They wear these T-shirts that say, how can I pray for you? And they walk up and down the streets, and they pray for people. They give out food to homeless people, and they witness for Jesus on Beale Street on Friday night. And I go with them about three or four times a year, sometimes five. I went with them a week ago, Friday night, shared my testimony, shared the gospel, prayed with people, bought a guy, a homeless guy, a meal. I never give them money, but I will buy them meals and things like that. Sometimes people say, why in the world would a preacher go down to Beale Street? There's so much sin there. That's like saying, why would somebody fish where there are fish? <laughs> I want to catch some fish. Why would I not go? Isn't that where Jesus would be? Isn't that where Jesus is? The Bible says in Luke 5, Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax collection booth. Levi, by the way, is, is also Matthew, who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Come be my disciple, Jesus said to him. He, Levi got up, left everything, followed Jesus. He became his disciple, got saved. Soon Levi held a banquet in his home. Now watch, with Jesus as the guest of honor, many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests were there. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus, why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I've come to call sinners to turn from their sins, not to spend my time with those who think they're already good enough. Wow. Jesus just kind of unloaded, didn't he? I'm going to hang around sinners because I came to seek and to save that which is lost. That's what we do. That's what we Christians do. We're like Philip in Acts 8, 35. Like Philip, he opened his mouth and beginning from the Scriptures, he preached, he shared Jesus with them. You need to be praying for lost people to be saved, that God will convict them and convert them and send a contact to them. You need to articulate the gospel so that when you have the opportunity, you'll know how to share the gospel. You need to think about people as eternal souls. When you see somebody, you ought to think about, will that person a million years from today be in heaven or hell? Do they know Jesus or not? You need to lovingly start conversations. You don't need to stay away from people all the time. You need to engage with people and lovingly engage them. And you say, how can I turn it from a, witness, from a casual conversation to a witnessing interview? Somewhere along the way, tell them where you go to church and then ask them, do, you, do they go to church? That changes everything. And then be ready to share your testimony. That kind of pulls them in a little bit. And then be ready to articulate the gospel, to share the gospel. And if you think they're ready, Sometimes even if you don't think they're ready, ask them, would you like to receive Jesus? And it will blow your mind how God will use you. Oh, listen to me. Successful Christian leaders share Jesus. One more thing. Successful Christian leaders not only share Jesus, but they make disciples. Verse 15. When she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. And that house, that little house of that sweet lady became the house church that changed all of Europe. Isn't it? She, they, she got grounded in the Word. She got baptized. 
Her house is where they came to study the Bible. It's where they invited their lost friends. They heard about Jesus. They got saved. They got baptized. They started growing in grace. They read the Bible. They prayed. They went through the scriptures. They were fellowshipping with each other. They learned how to witness together. It's one of the reasons I love Billy Graham. He doesn't just emphasize winning people to Jesus, but he and his organization have always trained people to follow up on new Christians and help disciple them. I got trained in 1978. Do you remember? How many of you remember the big Billy Graham crusade at the Liberty Bowl back in 1978? I was one of the counselors down there, and I got to lead some people to the Lord down there. One of them was a guy I'd been praying for at college. It got led to the, I led him to the Lord down there. But we followed up with him. Why? Because once somebody gets saved, they need to become a true follower, a disciple. They need to be grounded in the Word of God. That's what Christian leaders do. I want to encourage you. Some of you out there don't know what your purpose in life is. I can't tell you everything God wants you to do, but I do know this. God is looking for Christians to lead, to influence. And you can do this. The Spirit of God is in you. He will help you do this. Your life is not over. Get back in the game. Get back in the fray. Get back in the spiritual war that's going on and influence people. How do I do it? How do I do it, pastor? How about starting out with trying to raise up new leaders? Go find you a Timothy. Go find somebody that doesn't know the Lord as much as you do and start pouring into them. Take them with you. Don't do ministry alone. And then once that happens, start encouraging other believers. I want to say this to you again. Have the ministry of putting courage back into other people. Write some people a letter. Give some people some money. Give some people your time. Encourage them. Strengthen them. Put courage back in them. And then follow the Holy Spirit. Don't just do whatever you want to do, but every day wake up and say, God, I die. Holy Ghost, live through me. And then share the gospel everywhere you go. And when people get saved, make disciples. May God, let's quit complaining Let's quit complaining about all, how bad the world is. Let's stop that. And let's start being the influencers that God wants us to be. Amen? Amen. Let's thank God for speaking to our hearts today. Amen? Thank you, Lord. And I think you know that those, that's not for me. That's for the Lord. Father, we thank you for Paul. We thank you for the leader that he was. Help us to go and do likewise in Jesus' name. And if you agree, say amen. amen. Let's all stand up. Today, if you don't know Jesus Christ, we invite you to come and know our blessed Lord and Savior. Our pastors are going to be here at the front. And if you today would like to repent of your sin, that means turn from your sin, turn to the Lord, and believe that Jesus died on the cross for you, rose from the dead to give you eternal life, and if you will receive Him, invite Him to come into your life, He'll change you. If you'll do that today, they'll take the Bible, show you how. If you want to have all your sins forgiven, if you want to come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, He'll change your life today. Come. No matter what you've done, He'll forgive you. And you come today. And you can become a Christian leader, filled with the Holy Spirit, walking in the Lord, helping other people. And you'll be making everybody around you a better person, influencing them for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why don't you come? If you're in the balcony, you want to make that decision. A lot of folks in the balcony today, right there at that banner that says Savior, you've got people waiting on you. Guys, wave, wave your hand over there, all right? There he is right there. Anybody on this side over here, all you guys, you go to that banner that says Way. On this main floor, you'll come here. These guys will be on the front. You just come. Ladies, we know you want to talk with a lady. We'll have ladies available when you come. But talk to the pastor first, the pastors, and then they'll put you with the lady. You couples need to come. You say, I, I'm already saved, but I've never been baptized. Hey, that, that'd be a great reason to come. Why don't you come and set up a time to be baptized? You say, well, I'm already saved and baptized, but I don't have a church family. Why don't you come and join Bellevue Baptist Church? Start that process and say, I want to be part of a church that wants to raise up new leaders. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's Bellevue. We want to raise up new leaders. So why don't you come? New influencers. You come and be part of what God's doing here. And if you just need prayer, we're here to pray with you. I'm going to pray. 
We're going to sing one more song of worship. And then when we're singing, I'm going to ask you, please, don't wait. Step out and come. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless this time of worship. Bless this time of decision. In Christ's name, amen. Let's sing out. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That He should give His only Son. To make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. being and with us today and speaking to us. Amen. How many of you were here last Wednesday night to hear Jim Cimbala? Wasn't that awesome? Amen. Listen, we didn't just name it Awesome August for no reason. It is awesome, all right? So we're going to have another, uh, you'll hear about that in just a minute. We're going to have another uh, service, Awesome August service this Wednesday night right here. Hope you'll be here. Tonight, we're having a service here and I'll be preaching, we'll be praying together. I'm preaching tonight on hypocrisy, the highway to hell. And I want you to be here tonight and see what Jesus said about hypocrisy, okay? All right, Brother Drew, after this uh, video about Awesome August, he's gonna close us out, okay? Get ready for an all new Awesome August on Wednesday nights at Bellevue. This week, join us as we welcome Matt Carter, pastor of Preaching and Vision at the Austin Stone Community Church. I pray, Jesus, would your name be exalted over my name. Don't miss this special time of worship and preaching on Wednesday nights at 630. And make your August awesome. All right. I know a lot of you have asked questions about the men in yellow vest and the drones flying over. Uh, some people were up, you know, concerned. But today we're doing a little traffic flow study, uh, trying to figure out how to get you on and off the campus a little bit better. So some had a lot of questions about that. So if you see those people as you leave, smile at them, wave at them. All right. 
Just wave at them. It'll freak them out, all right? <laughs> Say, man, that's the friendliest church I've ever seen, all right? And uh, all right, let me pray for you and remind you, if you wanted to make a decision but didn't, we're going to be down front, and we'd love to opportunity to speak to you before you leave. All of you who are not connected in a life group, in the lobbies today as you leave, you can pick up information. You need to find a small group, okay? And we want to help you do that. We know that there's probably a thousand people in here that uh, are not connected. If that's you, you can elbow your husband and tell him it's time. All right, <laughs> let's pray. Lord, thank you. Uh, Lord, thank you that uh, we got to be here today to be encouraged, to to sing uh, praises to you. And now, Lord, as we leave, Lord, uh, bless all that we do this week. And we pray that in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.